Sure. Sure. Oh, I want to wait. You you're right. Drag it out. You're welcome to vote about that. Not yet. Welcome, everybody, to Boardman, and um, we'll start the July meeting of the Oregon Watershed Enhancement Board. And um, Maida is going to give you a little overview of um, our schedule. And again, if you are going to participate in the comment period, get your notice in. Do we have some, Derica? Okay. All right, for the record, Maida Lofsgarden, Oregon Watershed Enhancement Board. Um, I'm just gonna talk a little bit about this afternoon and then how, how this is starting off a little bit different than we typically do. So we are not gonna start with board member comments. We will do those in the morning. At that same time, I'll run you through the blue folders as well. Though I would just mention one thing, there are a lot of public comments around um, both our council capacity funding decision and the um, formerly known as outreach grants. So I'll reference, I'll refer you to those in the morning, but if you haven't had an opportunity yet, those are ones you might wanna look at ahead of time because there are a lot of comments there. This afternoon, um, I really wanna thank you all for coming. Um, I know this added some extra time onto your day, but this afternoon we will be focused on the strategic plan. We'll have general public comment first, and then per a conversation I think that we had probably in January, um, we've asked the Coalition of Oregon Land Trust, Network of Watershed Councils, Oregon Association of Conservation Districts, and the Oregon Conservation and Education, Education and Assistance Network to join us for about a half an hour and talk about their perspectives as they are the membership organizations for the majority of our grantees. So they're gonna spend some time in conversation with you, fairly open dialogue, so feel free, I think, Sean, to ask questions if you guys have them along the way. Um, they've had, they have copies of the latest information and we'll be speaking from that. From there, we will move into the strategic plan conversation um, with our facilitators um, with the goal of getting a sense from you all um, about the two documents, who we are and the strategic priorities, just to get a sense that are we in the right place to begin moving forward. So you may hear some stuff in public comment or from the statewide organizations that cause you to wanna rethink. What we will not be asking for at that point in time is, is um, spelling changes and um, sentence structure. Um, it, I'm certain we missed some of that and we will be glad to fix it. What we're after is, do we have the right words in the right place? Um, do you feel comfortable that if you send staff to work on things, we're sending them to work on the right things? So that's, that will be this afternoon and then we'll adjourn and dinner is over, is it back over there or here? here. Dinner is here. So we'll adjourn and go directly to dinner here. Um, so any questions before we get started? Great. All right, uh, public comments for the strategic plan, Sean Morford and Kelly Beamer. Oh, but are you guys the 30 minute? We can do the last one of them, Okay, so before you come up, let's see if there are, were there any others, Derica? Okay, so a last call, any other public comment before we then move in, we will, are we gonna have the four of you come up together? What's your? Yes, I'm in. Yes, you are. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So why don't you all go ahead and come up. We can pull up a couple extra chairs here and shift folks around as needed. And if I might, um, co-chairs, I do want to um, make a little bit of an introduction to of the two people who are sharing, carrying a chair up um, right now so that they don't have to do as full of an introduction. So if you all remember, um, Jerry Nicolescu retired at the end of June, and it takes two people to fill <laughs> Jerry's spot currently. So you'll see um, both um, Pat and Whitney are going to be joining us um, in the interim while they are working on hiring an executive director for OACD. So we're thrilled to have them both here. The organization is in very capable hands.
maybe I'll kick it off, <laughs> since you guys have, have, have some paper in front of you. Um, for the record, my name is Kelly Beamer. I'm the executive director of the Coalition of Oregon Land Trusts. Um, we represent 19 members uh, of Colt and one as new associate member, Western Rivers Conservancy. Um, and all of our members work with private landowners to conserve land in perpetuity. Um, and I really appreciate the opportunity to kind of engage at this point. I know I went to the listening session in Clackamas and we were way up at the 30,000 foot level and it feels like it's getting more to the 15,000 foot level and you're about to go into probably more of a granular strategic planning discussion. So being able to share some comments with you at this point is a, um, a privilege and, and so I appreciate the opportunity. Um, and I think just taking a step back, looking at the Who We Are document, um, I just want to commend and say that you know the Coalition of Oregon Land Trust, several of our members have read through this, and we really um, we're really excited about it. Um, I think that the commitment that this document show, shows is bold, transparent, science-based, and people-based, and it caught, it cuts across generations. This is really making a commitment to the future Oregonians. Um, in the state. And similarly, land trusts are very much in the business of forever and of long-term impact. Um, our land trusts are, we call it the audacity, audacity of forever. Um, basically, we're in the business of protecting land forever in perpetuity and setting up our organizations to ensure that that is the case. Um, I have two major comments. Um, first one is just um, specifically getting into the second document you have um, that gets into stra strategic priorities for impact. And you guys do have these in front of you, right? <laughs> um, and I'm just going to dive in um, into that one. In particular, um, I think we all know the work that OEB does is based on strong partnerships on the ground. They're based on strong public-private partnerships with the implementers. That involves shared trust and also shared risk. And I, I know the facilitator in the session I was at talked about leaning into subjects in this process. It's really encourage you to lean in. And around this discussion with, um, with regards to risk, I want to encourage the board to really lean in. Um, from a land perspective, um, land preservation is a high risk, high reward work. Buying land for conservation is complex. It involves multiple factors and partners over very long timelines. However, the reward is lasting. Um, I brought as an example the Willamette Confluence Project where the Nature Conservancy purchased over 1,200 acres along the Willamette River to restore 14 gravel mining pits into a dynamic, amazing riparian area. So the underlying land purchase there really secures a multi-million dollar investment over time um, that involved planting over 200,000 trees, hundreds of volunteer hours, and ultimately a really successful project because over time the floodplain is owned by an organization whose mission is to protect that land for fish and wildlife habitat in perpetuity. Um, so your number four and, and the impacts talk specifically about bold and innovative actions to achieve health in Oregon's watershed. And I really like that bold is, um, is a theme that comes, that's, comes out throughout all of these documents. Um, and I would ask as the board continues to refine these stra strategic priorities, you continue to be bold and innovative and that involves bringing on risk. And that involves recognizing that your partners are also taking on risk and that's shared as well as the shared trust. Um, the language in here when I was reading through it, though, I, I do want to explicitly ask for, um, for the addition of, of the um, reference to acquisition. Um, the characteristics for future, you, uh, the document talks about OEB has an established process for gauging the risk and weighing it against potential gain of proposed innovative restoration work. Um, I'd like that, I think the land trust community would like to see that specifically include acquisition as well. And um, that goes for bullet point number four, just being aware that when we're talking about restoration work, perhaps it already is inclusive in your meaning of restoration, but that that long-term component is also, um, is also a, piece, a piece of the language. So land trusts have responded to the needs of Oregonians by taking on risk building um, as organizations in our infrastructure, 
Um, and I wanted to just highlight, I think I've been bringing you all along with the fact that the Oregon Land Trusts are undergoing a major capacity building initiative right now. We are in year five of a $10 million, 10-year um, capacity growing program um, through the Land Trust Alliance here in Oregon. Um, it's really exciting. We took a moment just to pause and kind of see what that meant in terms of building the infrastructure among our Oregon Land Trusts. And in the past five years, land trusts have added 30 full-time staff positions. They've increased their operating budgets by 20%, and they've protected over 44,000 acres. So in addition, a majority of our owner, our members are now accredited organizations, and they're holding insurance to protect those land protection um, conservation pur purchases over time. So land trusts are really we see ourselves as partners with OEB in its mission and implementing its mission, and we stand ready to share that risk and grow mutual trust um, in, in the restoration investments ahead. The second piece, uh, the first one is risk. The second one is really around connecting to people. Um, and I wanted to say one reaction from our members just looking at the documents was just how people-centric they were and what an appreciation we have for that. Um, they recognize the connection between healthy watersheds and the people they serve. Um, OEB staff and board and the advisory committee obviously did an incredible job to acknowledge this and, um, and, that, and that people are at the center of, of OEB's work. And not only people as in the implementers, the stakeholders, the districts, the land trusts, the councils, but the people, the public at large, um, and the diversity of what that public looks like in Oregon. Um, so we recognize that as, as a land trust community, I just wanted to share, we're having this dialogue as well concurrently. How do we reach out and engage more people in Oregon? Um, we saw, you know, and when Measure 76 passed, 75% of every county in Oregon voted to support conservation. That was an amazing moment in time. Um, we feel inspired to keep that momentum by engaging our fellow Oregonians in our communities. Um, so just along that theme, I wanted to speak briefly on behalf of the partnership. Um, what we're proposing to do together in the next two years is really take on this engagement piece. Um, watershed councils, land trusts, and districts are working towards a joint communications plan to show how our work matters to the lives of more Oregonians and to inspire actions among more Oregonians. Um, we recently just produced our, our recent State of the Lands report, and of course we always talk about the number of acres protected, but something interesting surfaced this year, and this was the number of people we touched, land trusts alone, in, in 2016, through events, through nature walks, through science on the land, restoration, volunteer events. Last year, our members touched 70,000 Oregonians, and while that's just a fraction of our state, it's a powerful position and powerful place we have to connect people to the land. Um, in particular, as more people move to urban areas um, and the gap between kids and nature grows, this role is going to become more and more important. And I'm really encouraged by the way this strategic planning seems to be very people-focused, um, connecting people to the work we do. Um, so just in conclusion, again, the Coalition of Oregon Land Trust and our members really believe we have a common purpose to protect and restore watershed health in a matter that's consistent with economic development and health of our communities. Um, so we look forward to working as partners going ahead um, and under our own individual organizations and also the statewide partnership we have. Um, and just really appreciate the opportunity to, to dig into what you have done so far and I wanna thank you for all that great work. So any, any questions? No. Um, Kelly, in perpetuity is a long, long time. Are you pretty confident that you guys are going to have funding to maintain the land acquisitions you have, um, especially when you consider climate change and other factors that are coming into play? Mm. That's a really good question. Um, one of the things that the land trust community nationally has done is really ask that question, what does it take to steward a land in perpetuity? And, um, and so the Land Trust Alliance is sort of the guiding statewide entity that helps us with these transactions, has set out um, sort of a formula of putting a percentage away to, to basically have in perpetuity where the endowment funds stewardship and monitoring. 
And so if you look across the board, I mean, land trust in Oregon have been active about 30 years. On the East Coast, you have organizations that have been around 200 years. <laughs> we're a new movement here, but I think that we're growing in strength and particular to that best practices model, um, having an endowment to serve every property um, is part of the formula. Uh, if you look at like the BPA mitigation program in the Willamette Valley, they'll actually fund that stewardship endowment to ensure that the organization has that capacity over time. So it's getting there. <laughs> Other questions or comments at this point? I guess it's my turn, yeah. I'm Sean Morford. I'm the executive director of the Network of Oregon Watershed Councils. And uh, I'm gonna, we hadn't compared notes before we uh, got up here today. So I'm gonna repeat a couple things that Kelly uh, mentioned that have become a part of the conversation around the strategic plan from Watershed Council board uh, boards and from our own network board. Um, first of all, I, I was asked to make sure that I offer my commendation to, to you as a board for the process that you have engaged with. This is not your typical strategic plan process. Over a long period of time, multiple opportunities to have input, uh, multiple learning styles and communication styles have been accommodated as part of this process. It's outcome focused with a focus on impact, and measurement and science, all of those uh, features of this have, have risen to the top in these conversations that I've had. Um, this really makes it a pleasure for us to be, us, us I should say, the board, uh, the network board, to be involved with this process. And it actually inspired the network's own strategic planning process as we think about how to uh, plan for our next years um, coming, coming up. Um, I'm sure that you've heard already from many watershed councils through the survey and the listening sessions, but I just want to underscore a couple of things. Uh, Kelly mentioned a couple of things that are also consistent with what I'm hearing from watershed councils. Um, there's a lot of interest in the verbiage on the social impacts component of the plan, especially the awareness and appreciation of Oregonians, which is number two under your intended impacts. Um, and the, the verbiage around working with partners to accomplish that, that sort of raised some questions around what that looks like and how that would be uh, operationalized, if you will. Um, the Oregonians recognizing the role in health of watersheds, which is number three under your priorities. Those uh, rose to the top uh, of the discussions because of a couple reasons. One is that they are very consistent with the mission and goals of many of the watershed councils. They see not just doing restoration as part of what they're about, but increasing the understanding of the community members in their watershed about the importance of watershed health. And so, especially in light of the eligibility change um, for outreach grants, it has been forced to happen. And um, the fact that uh, it's an increasing need, as Kelly mentioned, for um, us in Oregon as our population increases and so on. So watershed councils uh, feel that that's an important part of what they are about, and they were really happy to see it reflected in the strategic plan. So the, some of the questions that came up around it were how, you know, they're more interested at right, right now in moving into the how. So we, I tried to get the conversation to stay in the what, which is what you, where you are, but they want to know, well, what does it mean to catalyze our partners to do this kind of awareness increasing and understanding increasing? Um, how does that, what does that mean for watershed councils, especially in light of the eligibility um, criteria change? How are the organizations that are helping you implement the strategic plan going to continue to keep their staff and their programs and their equipment uh, going so that they can help you uh, accomplish this part of your mission? So there's a lot of questions about how that would actually take place on the ground. Um, and they're really looking forward to the discussions and being part of that discussion as you go forward. Um, one of the questions that, uh, I think it was a conversation I had with Maida, 
um, that, I, that I put to our board around the role of, of OWEB related to being a convener and a, and a statewide leader or just a funder. Maybe that's more black and white than, than it was really presented, but the idea is do we take on, we, the OWEB um, staff and board, take on a leadership role in the state in convening and uh, taking on issues? And the answer was pretty, pretty consistent, at least with the councils that, that I was able to speak with about it. Um, absolutely, yes, there's an important niche for the OWEB um, organization and staff to do that kind of thing. There's no one else that has that kind of role. So they were urging me to urge you to continue to look for what is the niche that, uh, that OWEB plays in the state and compare it with other states to see what your role is that you can play in a unique way. Um, just a couple of other things. Uh, uh, oh, uh, consistent with what Kelly was talking about, number four under, what is it? Oh, the strategic priorities. The bold and innovative actions. I think it's bold to include that in a strategic plan. I admire it. And it also um, requires some thinking about what that means and who's going to be really taking the lead in being bold and innovative and enabling the folks that are implementing for you and with you to be innovative and bold. And it, it is something about risk taking, but it's also about implementing this term that we've heard so often through the years, adaptive management. And what does that mean? And some councils that I talked with said, don't be afraid to use the term adaptive management, even though it feels like it's just jargon. It's not jargon. There's a whole science around adaptive management and how it's implemented and how it's supported. So spending some time to really put yourselves in the role of adaptive management supporters and think about what that means in terms of funding and it, what it means about working with the um, permitting organizations and, and working with them to allow more risk taking and innovation. And the innovation is not just about how you put stuff on the ground, it's innovation about organizations and collaboratives. So it's the social science as well as the physical sciences. I thought that was my alarm here. No. <laughs> okay. Um, I think that might, oh, uh, number five, I just loved one comment that I got back. Um, the value of working lands fully integrated into watershed health, um, th that is, very much supported, um, but the comment that I that came back to me very simply said, "Outreach, outreach, outreach." So we've got to find a way to support our watershed councils and grant other grantees in being able to do that outreach. Uh, last comment is uh, a thank you, perhaps, uh, for including the priority for funding things that is difficult for for organizations to get funded in another way. So in particular, capacity grants. Um, organizations across the state, we have 58 that are funded by OWEB, and without the funding f to support their capacity, it's very difficult to find other funders who will do that. So that's a critical niche that this uh, board can play and does play, and we really support you continuing that function. I think that's all I'll say, and I'll hand it over. Pat, you've been prepared. I'll oh, ask Jason. Jason. Okay. Go ahead, Pat. For the record, my name is Pat Fitzgerald, and I am the um, elected president of Oregon Association of Conservation Districts and the interim executive director while we're conducting our search for a permanent replacement. My partner in crime here to my right is um, Whitney Collins, who is the uh, manager of the Baker, for the Phi Baker SWCDs, and so she is joining me in this effort, and um, it's quite a task. So I wanted to start off by thanking you, all of you, for um, the support you have and of, of our partnership and uh, the work that we do in conservation. And I also want to take an opportunity to thank you for 
letting us address you here this afternoon. Um, Oregon Association of Conservation Districts is probably the, in, in Oregon anyway, the older of all of the organizations. We represent 45 districts throughout the state of Oregon. Most districts are actively um, involved with uh, placing voluntary conservation efforts on working farms and working um, ranch lands throughout the state of Oregon. So um, that little tweak, the working portion of it, it makes this partnership very interesting and complete. Um, you know, we're, the conservation districts do conserva conservation work to help a farm improve its productivity. As my predecessor used to say all the time, you can't grow plants on a rock. So it's, uh, it's important work that we all do, and I want to thank you. Um, the districts, the, the conservation districts in the state of Oregon are governmental special districts, so therefore they have the capacity to hold conservation easement themselves as well as um, outright ownership of working ranches and ro working farmlands, much like um, the Coalition of Land Trusts do, and there have been some nice collaborations throughout our districts together with uh, many of the land trusts in the state of Oregon and funding that Kelly talked about earlier through VPA is a big component of that. And so uh, it's, it's, it's a nice partnership that we've formed here. It's relatively new. We're only about four years old. We started out with two and now as you see in front of you, we have four of us um, sitting here with very similar interests. And the interesting part about this collaboration is that we're, the power of it is able to leverage funding from throughout the nation, really, and bring additional conservation dollars to the state of, of Oregon. Um, that may not have been possible had this uh, collaboration not existed. Uh, I'll just make one example. Um, all of you, I'm sure, have heard Back in 2015, the intended, the administration's intent to um, list sage grouse as a uh, protected species, and the impact of it would have been devastating on eastern Oregon, um, including um, the infrastructure, which traveled across miles and miles of sage grouse habitat. Um, and so, um, through Oregon's reputation as a collaborator with one another, um, we applied for and were granted a grant to um, do conservation plans on, in seven districts on the eastern side of the state that are located in the sensitive sage-grouse habitat. And um, the result has been that for those collaborating ranchers um, and farmers, that they're able to prote be protected should there ever be an incidental take of, a, of, a, of, the, of the bird, and it also delayed the listing of it until uh, 2020 when it'll be reviewed again. So, um, you know, that was, a, that was a big win for the state of Oregon and, and for our, um, you know, partners throughout the eastern part of the state. And just an aside on that, that was actually learned from history here in Oregon where Spotted Owl, um, you know, uh, was listed um, on, the e on the western side of the state and many, many cities and towns and um, that relied upon the logging industry were devastated by that, by that listing. So um, there, was, there was a uh, lesson learned there, if you will. Um, of our, of our special districts that we represent, 10 or 12 have, have been successful in getting tax bases to assist them in their capacity and their ability to, to staff their offices. And so that's, um, that's something that makes um, the conservation districts a little bit different than others. Most of the conservation districts cohabitate in an FSA office or an, uh, along with a, our partner, the NRCS. And so, um, you know, there's a streamlining of services that are allowed to deliver conservation out on, on the ground where it really counts. So when you can have 
um, three members representing FSA, NRCS, and the district looking at a, at a landowner's property <coughs> and scratching their heads and figuring out what's going to work best for that person. It's powerful. It's very powerful. Um, as I mentioned earlier, our partnership is about four years old. Originally, it was Oregon Association of Conservation Districts and the Network of Watershed Councils. And in the last year, um, um, Ocean Kelly and also Jason um, have joined us. And, and uh, the, the new partnership that will actually be going forward will be four of us. Um, and it was funny, we were, uh, we had, I think, the last of the old meetings a couple of weeks ago on July 13th in Southern Oregon, just between the watershed councils and, and OECD, and, and uh, there was def a definite component missing in our conversation, so going forward, that'll be a four-way uh, meeting, and it'll be a lot more powerful than what it, what it has been. So, um, I guess the final thing I'd like to mention is um, OECD is going through a transition now. Um, Whitney um, comes into town uh, once a month and helps me manage the fiscal end of the business. Um, I do the yes ma'am work with her that she directs and, and uh, attend most of the meetings, being that I live on the east uh, western side of the state. and. Uh, if I tell you that this lady works hard, I'm not lying to you. As I drove out here, my inbox was empty, and when I arrived here at the convention center, uh, she, uh, she arrived an hour or two earlier than me, and my inbox was absolutely full. So um, I appreciate all of her efforts and hard work that she does with us. Hello? So I'm Whitney Collins. I am the district manager for the four SWCDs in Baker. I do have a BCACD, which is a 501c3 that umbrellas. So there is five entities, but four districts. So um, as Pat said, we are going through, OECD is going through a transition right now, and we're working as a team along with member districts and the board of directors to accomplish the, the goals that we have under our current grants. Um, Pat and I have done a lot of talking about um, strategic planning and that's in the process for OACD. And overall, OACD's goal is to continue uh, to help districts implement conservation work within their respective boundaries by being fiscally responsible, educated, forward thinking, and innovated through grant funding, partnerships, and capacity building. So that's what Pat and I are working on right now. Stay tuned. Well, thank you. Thank you, Whitney. I'll just conclude by again thanking OWEB for your support of this partnership and, and, uh, and, and the work that you do in the world of conservation. I can't stress enough how important it is. And um, as I said earlier, it does allow this partnership to leverage additional dollars. I'll just conclude with one thought. Um, I don't know historically if it's ever um, this has ever occurred, but a couple of weeks ago, um, there was a dedicated effort on behalf of the FSA, the, the, um, all of the groups that are represented here in front of you in um, lobbying at the legislature to um, hopefully get the Oregon Hag Heritage Bill passed. And um, so, this coalition um, spent, well, months leading up to the, the, the day of the lobbying, and um, we're very proud to say that it was a successful effort. There is seed money now um, that the legislature has, has granted Oregon Ag, Ag Heritage um, Bill, and that will lead to and leverage again additional dollars coming down the road to preserve and protect farms and family operations and uh, it's it's no small task that um, there's so uh, many challenges to maintaining a farm or a ranch in the family um, from all kinds of different angles that that's a very important start to I think a very exciting work for conservation again in Oregon 
So again, that's all I have to say, and we appreciate the opportunity to talk to you. Are there any questions of any of us? For the record, Jason Pacera, Oregon Conservation Education and Assistance Network. So I just wanted to really quickly just talk about uh, you know, our, our position in that we're kind of at the intersection of, of you know, the statewide organizations and then also individual employees for councils and districts. And your guys' focus on, in the strategic plan on innovation, on capacity, and on people is, is where, that's kind of where we live, uh, being, being kind of the, the, the holder of the conference, basically convening people and bringing them together. So your support of, of those goals for the, the delivery system for the people on the ground is, is very admirable, and we appreciate that because that's what we as an organization are about as well. So just being able to deliver you know, new science, new innovation, the opportunity for partnerships uh, is, is, is very important for the people on the ground. So thank you for your support of those, those, those goals and uh, of the partnership in helping to deliver those goals. Any questions or comments from the board? All right, thank you all very much. Thank you. Randy Labby, a public at large member and co-chair, and I'm going to segue into our next section, uh, the board's discussion of the strategic plan led by Steve Patty and his associate, Jessamyn Lewis. And I wanted to um, preface this by saying that but just before the meeting, I had a chance to talk to Steve and um, I was very impressed with how he distilled the work that we did in uh, Salem and magically wordsmithed it into just what we hoped for. We'll see if others agree with me, Steve. <laughs> if I may, this is Maida Lofts Garden for the record. Um, Randy just did something very good, and this is a reminder, this is our second board meeting where we have audio minutes. So if, when you speak, if you could either introduce yourself, or if Randy already has by recognizing Alan, for example. It's, Alan doesn't have to say it again, but just make sure, um, otherwise it's very hard on audio to tell who was saying what. And we certainly want to attribute everything we can to Laura, but not, <laughs> it isn't appropriate. <laughs> Well, good afternoon, board. This is Steve Patty with Dialogues in Action. Um, thank you for clearing some time to talk this through. Our uh, desire is um, that we, uh, this afternoon, get your sense on these two pieces that are in front of you. The Who We Are document, which captures, um, as Kelly said, the, the 30,000 foot level picture of you as an organization and what you're all about. And, uh, and then secondly, the, uh, the priorities um, document, the strategic priorities, which is the 15,000 foot level. It sends us in a direction. It, uh, it frames and sets priorities for the future. And, um, and once we get your sense on both of these, uh, from here we will be able to then get to work uh, thinking about the how, uh, building out the strategies, thinking about the sequence of those, um, the reach of those, the metrics and measures related to how we will know we're making progress on those kinds of things. So there's a whole body of work yet to come once we have your, your sense of, of, of comfort um, related to these two pieces. Uh, but before we dive into these, and we'll do these in, in sequence, we'll tackle the who we are first and then the strategic priorities. Um, let me just remind you briefly of the, of, of the process that we're going through just again to set this conversation in context. Um, the big uh, yellow um, arrow is, is where we are right now, which might be slightly misleading because it suggests that we're, that we're right toward the end of this, but I imagine we're about halfway through the, 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 the kind of work that needs to be done. So we went through a get clear phase um, where uh, the, the board uh, um, in, engaged with the staff in thinking through the Who We Are document. Uh, we convened six community sessions um, around the state 
um, uh, held uh, over 30 interviews and deployed a questionnaire uh, for uh, over 100 uh, responses on those. With the, the distillation of all of that um, uh, was then communicated in, in a couple reports that you, you received. One was the, uh, the themes from the interviews. The second was the, uh, the, the ideas from the, the questionnaire, the survey. And, uh, and, and the third was this piece of who we are that is in front of you right now that's gone through multiple iterations. And uh, Randy was too generous in suggesting that it was all our work. This has gone back and forth with the staff and Meta and the many, many people that have had their hands on this uh, kind of shaping the, the, um, the, 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 the ideas and the, and the communication of that. So that, that, that's the get clear phase. You've seen this document before a few times, but we'd like to, to revisit that again today just to, to kind of check in with you on that. And then, um, and then our, our, um, our time together a month or so ago with, uh, with the board and with the external advisory group um, as they visited us for a bit, we thought through the strategic pivots that all of this seemed to represent or suggest going forward. So adjustments to trajectory or, or um, areas in which the trajectory stays, should stay exactly the same. And then that, that set, set the stage for the, the development of strategic priorities, which, which we have eight in front of us. And, um, and, and then uh, once we get your sense of that, that gives us um, marching orders for this next phase. Uh, that we'll, we'll just we'll, uh, dig down uh, with the staff, with stakeholders, with focus groups, uh, with, uh, with, with partners and stakeholders, and begin to actually design what does this then look like. Uh, what, what, what should we do and who should be doing it and, and uh, at what pace and, and that kind of thing. So, so this, is, this is where we are in the, in the process. Why don't we uh, f first um, take a look at the Who We Are document. And um, my, my sense is since you've looked at this a few times that this will be a quicker conversation, although that's always hazardous to suggest. But I want, want to make sure that we... We, we have time, uh, enough time set aside for the priorities since, uh, since that, that might be a new framing of, of our conversation from last time. So the, the Who We Are document, we've been, um, uh, we, we've been thinking through a rubric that, um, that, uh, that frames the fundamental ideas of the organization in, in, um, in four different species of, of, uh, of, of, of ideas or, or, or thoughts. Uh, boxes, we're calling them, just for the sake of, uh, of, the, uh, of the, the schema here. We probably won't carry that forward into public um, communiques, but, uh, but the, these are the four. Intended impact, uh, box C, best means, so the, the approach we take. Uh, premises, the fundamental ideas upon which this work is built. And ultimate aims, the ethos and ethic, the atmosphere that, that, is, that is emerging. And all these then direct and work toward this, set, this, this box E, which is action framed by the priorities, and then, then we, we, we build those out. So um, let me just walk you through th uh, the latest version of this that uh, hopefully represents our conversation from the board retreat a month or so ago. Um, and um, instead of pausing e each of these boxes, I think I'll just walk you through the whole thing and then when, once you see the whole, you can reflect and we can have discussion on, on that. So the, the first set of ideas is, is really about the, the, um, the, 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 the ethic, the ethos, the attitude, the atmosphere. What people experience when they experience a web um, are these kinds of things. And we have four ideas that, that a web shows up in a bold kind of way. So in all things, we will be bold. The OEP shows up openly and transparently, that there's, there's, there's just this sense about it that is, um, as you read, uh, committed active two-way communication internally and externally as a means for developing and maintaining strong partnerships. There's just a sense of, of, of openness and transparency. Um, th thirdly, that there's a consideration in everything that OEP does for future generations, that the long view is taken consideration for, uh, for Oregon and Oregonians 50 years from now, 200 years from now. And then this, this fourth was, a, um, was a, uh, uh, an addition to the, the three that you had initially, and uh, uh, this was suggested by Meta. We had 
some conversations right at the end of our, of our, of our last time together. But th this is about the, the attitude of being curious, of showing up with not just having all the answers, not just uh, dictating, not just telling, but of, of being curious about what's happening, what's going on. So there's a sense of, of listening and question asking and this, this kind of ethos to OWEB as well. So box A, ultimate aims. Uh, box B on the, the next page, uh, premises, what we believe in. We just wanted to articulate uh, uh, a limited set of ideas that would provide the most substantive rationale for the work that you do. And we wanted these ideas to be accessible broadly, that any Oregonian who might read these or hear these would be drawn in and, um, and, and, and sense the value that you bring and what, and, and what you're all about. So four ideas here, dedicated to the idea that healthy watersheds sustain healthy communities. It's not just about land and water, it's about communities. Uh, dedicated to the idea that every Oregonian plays a role in the health of our watersheds. It's not just for the professionals or the partners, but it's about everyone who lives in this state, that there's a role for all of us to play. Dedicated to the idea that it takes, a bro that it takes broad partnership to support resilient watersheds. And we appreciated s significantly the, the, uh, the, the feedback and comment from our partners here today. The, the significance of, of, of building broad partnerships for this kind of work. And then um, dedicated to the idea that future generations need whole and healthy watersheds, just the, the significance of this work for, um, for the future uh, health, vitality, and uh, vibrancy of our state. Uh, next box, turn the page to intended impacts. This is the change that, that you want to achieve and again, this is the, the real, real high-level ideas of change. The priorities are the are are the the, um, the 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 narrower, more focused ideas of change. Uh, so this is you know 20 years from now, 50 years from now, as a result of OEB, 100 years from now, there'll there'll be change in these in these in these kinds of areas in these aspects or domains. So uh, certainly, number one, right up front, healthy, resilient watersheds is an ecological uh, achievement impact. Number two, broad care and stewardship of the watersheds by Oregonians. I appreciated our, our partners' comment about the social dimension of this work, that, uh, that, that Oregonians care, and that they're good stewards of watersheds wh wh wherever they go and whatever role they have to play. Number three, adaptive capacity of communities to support resilient watersheds is a, a, a community resilience. Uh, for resilient watersheds, so adjustment, adaptation, um, action. Uh, number four, an economic uh, impact. Strengthen economies emerge from healthy watersheds. This, the, this, the sense that, that, um, that how significant watersheds are to, to all kinds of economies, and certainly front and center, agriculture, forestry, fishing, recreation, but also the, 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 the larger economy um, uh, of, of uh, of tech, of education, that all, all these in some way depend upon healthy watersheds. And then number five, strong and diverse partnerships promote and sustain healthy watersheds. So there's a, there's a sectoral impact that, that OWEB has um, as a result of its work. So these are the big buckets of impact, the big uh, uh, ideas of achievement. Can I just ask a clarifying question? Yeah. Sectoral, um, oh, sorry, Laura Masterson. Um, I, sectoral, does, is that, are we talking about like the restoration sector of the economy? Is that what, I mean, or what, what I just have never, I, I was puzzled by what that meant. Uh, by that, by that word. May, did you want to weigh in on that? I can, yeah, um, made a loft's garden for the record. Um, that's exactly it. The, the, um, there's this larger economic piece, but that the partnerships at all levels, so the, the sector that is doing this restoration work is strong and diverse. So that, um, when we looked at that, that meant strong watershed councils, so on, or conservation districts and land trusts, but also strong groups, like you'll hear from tomorrow, the Lower Columbia Estuary Partnership that is more regional, the um, Bonneville Environmental Foundation that is foundational. And so one of the things that we've, we've talked about some, not here, but with this group, is that at the end of the day, we would have this web 
not just here's the local group, here's the regional group, here's the statewide group, but this web that supports, so you can see the role of the funder and how it rolls through, and you can see the role of the local organizations and how they connect together, and at the end of the day, we see that we have this strong and diverse set of partnerships that isn't just, it absolutely includes our traditional partners, but it isn't just that, so it is a sector approach. So si similarly, if you were looking in the agriculture sector, that you've got strong farming, ranching, but you also have a strong market supply, you also have strong transportation, you have, so you have everything to make that successful, that's the same kind of approach here. Thank you, Laura. But one, oh, uh, one, one final, final set of ideas for this particular piece here um, that sets us up for the priority piece is this, uh, this best means box, a set of ideas about the approach we take. And this, this uh, set of ideas re really, uh, as, as we go forward, we'd like to, to embed all of these ideas in the, um, in, in the actions and the strategies and the tactics going forward. So. There are a set of five here. Whatever we do needs to be characterized by involving stakeholders broadly and in partnership, using best available science supported by local knowledge. If you remember our conversation, we decided to fuse these together as, uh, uh, so, so that they, they, they be, be become, become joined. Available science should not be apart from local knowledge, and that local knowledge should not be apart from available science. Uh, investing with long-term outcomes in mind demonstrating impact through meaningful measurement and reaching and involving underserved populations. That, that's the, the, how our conversation on uh, those who are underrepresented uh, under with, within this kind of work, uh, that, that, that's where this idea ends up here, reaching and involving underserved populations. So um, that is, that's the latest version of who we are. Um, wondering what you think. So there might be some uh, some some small uh, um, you know typos or wording matters that that uh, feel free to uh, jot down and just send them to us. But but conceptually, uh, is this in a, about the right spot? Um, and does this represent um, sufficiently enough our conversation from the board retreat? So are there? Are there, are there things you'd like to press into, questions you want to ask about clarifications, things you want to underscore for us? What do you think? Yeah, this is uh, Dan Thorndike. Um, question, I, I was looking through lots of the other comments and stuff too. One, one aspect that came up quite frequently was our flexibility. And I'm just wondering, is that enough? I mean, I know it's probably in here one of these bullets, it's sort of everything kind of comes <laughs> together, but um, yeah. But that seemed to come up as a pretty consistent theme and, and thing that, that people liked about uh, OWEB. And, and to me, it strikes me as being a very important thing because of just not knowing exactly what's going to happen, when, how, and the ability to be flexible. It's in there, just whether that's up there at that same level as, as the, uh, some of the other. Um, words we're using. Yeah, um, thank you for raising that. I, I think initially that, that was one of the options for box A, the ultimate aims, that in all things would be flexible. And, um, and then in our, in our kind of sense taking, it, 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 it didn't make the cut on there. Um, we, we could either kind of reconsider that or, or, or possibly build it in a bit to the be curious idea as, a, you know, as, as curiosity, we were also responsive to. Right, yeah, this again, again, because I know it, eventually it comes up in another box, right? It's it, maybe the means or something like that, but, but I'm almost getting the sense it's a little more core uh -huh. um, concept to include in one. I think it would fit in one of those, those broader ones. Maida um, Lofsgarden, I um, like, uh, I think if I remember right, one of the reasons it fell lower is um, there's this question about what do you have to lean into, what's easy for you versus what you, you have to lean into, and given that we have 18 different grant offerings, I think we found, uh, we felt we didn't need to lean into the flexible because we're maybe a little, we do a lot of that, but I really like this idea of the result of being curious is that we are we then have these flexible offerings, which is how we've gotten to where we have with all of these. So I I 
I would say it felt really comfortable in that conversation for you guys using the flexibility and the curiosity. The flexibility is the end of what comes when you're mm -hmm. curious. Um, if, if, unless folks want to raise it as its own. Rosemary? I, oh, Rosemary Furphy for the record. Um, just to add another word, um, when I saw curious, be curious, and I know we had the conversation about it. The other word that I thought could add to that and maybe add a little more punch is be innovative. And it might be related to flexibility. Um, but curious, to me, could also be passive. Yes, you're curious, but I'd like to see some action then attached to that. And that's where innovation came to me. So I will toss that out to the group. Um, and one thought in response to that, uh, we were trying to cap capture the idea of innovation under the Be Bold heading, as, as uh, b b b boldness is an, is an attitude, and, and then from an attitude of boldness, then we'd be unafraid to explore new ideas, even run, run counter. So we could either strengthen that with, with the idea of innovation or consider adding another one. Would that be your recommendation, Rosemary, to, yeah. to add innovation into that? Yeah. Jason. Jason Robinson, for the record. Um, so just, a, I guess, a process check. I know with our strategic planning um, summit that we had, we talked about kind of lumping and splitting. And I think we had had that conversation about bold and innovative and trying to combine those. So I just wanted to circle back, because I know we'd had that conversation, whether we want to go back into the lumping splitting d discussion or not I, I i definitely support what rosemary is saying is that innovative is part of being bold how do we capture that um i think is the question so thank you steve uh, randy lappy for the record um just to for my own benefit is has the outside advisory board uh critiqued this current version not this current version okay no they received it okay if if I may, made a loft's garden. Um, th the way that the process was set up is they were feeding it to you, and so now it's okay. handed to you. Okay. Debbie, so we have we have thoughts to to um, to strengthen the be bold of box A with innovation and strengthen the be curious be curious of box A to flexibility. Are there are there other things you see in any of the boxes that you'd like to to comment on? So I want to respond to the bold and flexible comment you, by reflecting that they fit in the priorities document. The bold, yes. the curious, bold, innovative, the flexibility seems to fit better there um, than in this section. I know we haven't gotten to that part of the discussion yet, but that's my thought. And it also circles back to we had that we did have that discussion about lumping and splitting, and I thought we landed on be bold, but. It's always easy to go back. And then I have a question about box C and the way it's written around adaptive capacity of communities, item three. I'm trying to figure out if, if what we meant had to do with community resiliency and the ability to respond to change. What, so as we talk about adaptive capacity of communities, I'm, I'm not getting what think it means in the paragraph descriptor. So I'd just like us to spend some time, not now, but spend some yes. time thinking about what do we mean by that. Okay. <laughs> to make sure that we capture to that. To make sure we capture what we mean. Community. Right. Yeah. So. And is it about community resiliency or is it about resilient watersheds or yes. diversity or, <laughs> or, or, or. <laughs> I believe the fundamental yes. intent of that is community resiliency that serves resilient watersheds. But the, the, the watershed idea is, is in number one, the front and center, the, the community resilience should be in number three. So we, we can work to strengthen that description. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, are there other, other comments or? On any of them? Yes, yes, on, on any of these boxes here before we move on to priorities. Rosemary? I'll uh, toss out another here. Um, the under B, the de dedicated to the idea that, and the, the first one, which is of great interest, 
Healthy watersheds sustain healthy communities. I think we heard that consistently at all levels, all forms. What I would, what I think would be good to see is it, in this, it tends to be a how we utilize and interact with watersheds might be helpful to have a sentence that what does healthy watersheds mean to us really more from an ecological, how would we know a healthy watershed if we saw it? So because then we move very quickly into the benefit and value to communities and individuals and future generations. But I think it would be good to capture that. And I tried to, I think we could come up with some language. Um, uh, and we have other, you know, kind of whole healthy watersheds even later. But again, trying to get at what do we mean by that, that ecological function, headwaters to the outlet, all those kinds of things that I think mm. I know we have a sentence somewhere that could describe that, but I think it would be helpful. The rest of the paragraph looks great, but it's much more of a uh, util utilizing the watershed approach, and I think right. we need a sentence for the, just the system itself and its value. Maida. Um, Maida Lofsgarden, I am glad you raised that, and I have a question for you, Steve. Is there, because the two things happen, one is we don't have a definition of healthy watersheds, and we don't just use it, like you said, Rosemary, in the first one. We, we use it everywhere. Um, and two is even people in the watershed world forget that a watershed goes from the top of the Cascades, for example, to the top of the coast range, that it is a ridge top to ridge top. It's not about the water. It's about what, where the water runs through and to. Um, is there a place in this, because those two things are a little bit more technical, that we can put that <clears throat> as a point to rather than high, tucking it into one of these when, like Rosemary said, it's kind of all, you know, is it a sidebar? Is it a? That's a great idea. Yes, this, uh, the, the whole who we are could be prefaced by a statement or two like that. This is what we mean by a watershed. This is what we mean by healthiness or something to that effect. Because we do use the word healthy watersheds time and time and time and time again through this. Laura? Laura Masterson, um, I would second that just because I feel like uh, in general as an agency we're talking about ecological health and most people think of watersheds as a subset of that. And I think the way that you that we're describing it here, it it's it isn't. It is the thing. It is the ecology, and we're calling it watersheds, and that is not broadly understood to be equivalent. So just making sure that's in there, too, somehow would be helpful. Yeah, this is Dan Thorndike. Um, just going back to that, I mean, it has to be pretty core. If we used to have it on all of our pens and pencils here, it was ridge top to ridge top was... And in here, and that does seem to have sort of gone. And and I I, I think it does. It was on the swag. What's that? That was on the swag. Yeah, it was on the swag, ridge top to ridge top, <laughs> on that whole thing. And I think that's sort of faded. And there is the natural tendency of folks who aren't in this stuff all the time. They hear watershed, they just think water. Yeah, really, they do. So I mean, we almost have to. Maybe we have to kind of go a little over the top there just to make it really clear because I think then that does loop back into the importance of you know a true properly defined watershed to all communities and to wherever they are and it it's one of those very basic premises that I think we need to that cut, cuts across a lot of mm -hmm. the rest of the stuff. That's a great case uh, for us to, to develop a preamble to, to this with a few of those definitional pieces and assumptions that we're making. Deb, Debbie Holland, so this makes me also wonder if not to make the preamble exhaustive, but. <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna but, throw everything in there. No, <laughs> just, you know, like we have we're gonna, those kind of core triple bottom line premises around ecological, economic, and social or communities. And so maybe we just talk about those three things in the preamble. What do those three things mean to us? Because then we, re we reference back to them in many different places. 
it's rather than just having it be about watersheds and is it a geography or is it the water or Dan. Any further yes. comment? Yeah, this is Dan Thorndike again. On, on B, the last, the future generations need whole and healthy watersheds. I, I don't, the more I read that, I'm not sure what it's saying too much or, or what it's adding. Um, Which one? The future generations need whole and healthy watersheds. It is just the way that's presented. I'm not sure exactly what the point is. When we, we know healthy watersheds sustain healthy communities, that, I don't know if that's actually kind of incorporated in that. Um, I'm not sure, I'm kind of just a little, when I'm just going through this in terms of, I, I, I just keep thinking that that could somehow be incorporated or whatever the key ma meaning of that can be incorporated in something else without it, just more words. I, I'm. Not sure I don't have a great suggestion. It's just when I'm reading stuff, it either like really rings true and it makes sense or I read it and I'm just not sure exactly why that's added as a separate yeah. section. It's Jason. Yeah. Jason Robinson. So just, a, I guess, a follow-up question or comment on that. If we take the tribal perspective, we look at multiple generations, it, it's really that's what we're trying to get at here is that our watershed health should be maintained for multiple generations. And so how do we how do we apply that in such a way? And I agree, the language doesn't quite say that, but I think that's what we were getting at, was how do we take that multi-generational context and say right. but the impacts we have today are going to last for generations. And so, you know, in, in the tribal context, you know, seven generations down the road should have the, the same ability to have healthy watersheds as we have today. Yeah, this, that this is, Dan, that, that would, it hit me a lot more than that and I think maybe also incorporated in that is the notion that this what we're doing now to make it better takes time there's two factors there mm -hmm. one is the importance of it to be going on forever but also I think a key premise that we're also constantly fighting politically or whatever is this stuff takes time yeah. and I'm not sure if that's stated as what clearly as it could be or should be yeah, that's really helpful. Why don't, why don't we see if we can um, state that in a way that captures that little, little more clearly and grippingly uh, the idea of the seventh generation, multi-generational piece to that, as well as the, the, the taking time, while, while, while we hang on to the, to the idea of that premise. So the clarifying question maybe, um, since we'll be helping write this, uh, made a Lofts Garden clarifying question. So I heard, I heard the two pieces clearly, but I also heard you say something else that I'm just gonna test with the group, and that is um, that first one, healthy watersheds sustain healthy communities could include, and I'm not, I, I'm not saying to take away the bottom one, I think we changed the bottom one, but if you said healthy watersheds sustain healthy communities now and in the future, you might capture everything that was in number four and we could rework number four into this that both is the impacts today, both good and bad, right? So good impacts that we're doing today impact multiple generations and it takes multiple generations to see the change we wanna see because it took us multiple generations to get here. Mm -hmm. That to me, those two things feel very different yeah, um, than what's down here and I don't necessarily wanna lose this but I wonder that we couldn't just wrap that 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 bottom one a little bit into the first one and really dig into this, this one. separately. So in that case, we would leave a fourth one. It's just going to look a lot different. And are folks comfortable with those two components being part of the new number four? Again, the impacts today, good or bad, impact multiple generations, and it takes multiple generations for this change to occur. Those are concepts you're all right with. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> this is Dan again. That triggers another thought, and actually, no. Jason's comment triggered another thought in terms of, of, of zinging that up a bit, because as I said, that the tribal perspective, say on first foods, first foods, is such a, you know, rather than all the jargony stuff about <clears throat> economic this and you know all that stuff, it's just the importance that this really all the stuff. This means you're what you're eating, and what you're drinking, and and stuff like that, which is pretty core. Um, and I think it conveys a message 
in a much more visceral way than you start talking about ecosystem services in words like that that people don't really understand you know the, so that that seven generation thing the first foods very much is what we're doing and i and i think that kind of language tends to um convey that more clearly than lots of other words do stephen yeah mate i just wanted to question your second bullet which you said takes multiple generations to either fix something or or make it bad uh, i'm not so sure that that's the case i think you can destroy a watershed in a lot less than a generation. <laughs> and I think if you say that it's going to take multiple generations to fix it, then we might as well forget about any performance measures um, that we're going to be measuring on an annual basis. So I, I think it takes a long time is a good point, but I'm, you know, I somehow caution on how you word that. I'm glad we have a few more months well, to, uh, to <laughs> shape this. Yes, sir. Well, Newhouser, so I, I wasn't part of some of this discussion. I like the direction of the new version of four. It seems like the, the two, two big things that strike me are, you know, in, in terms of a premise and then how that would drive decisions and actions in the future would be things like that says we should uh, be attentive to short-term fixes versus deeper fixes and prioritize the deeper fixes. Um, and then also it provides the, a clear opening for why we're considering climate change in, for instance, in requiring, and also in requiring groups to have strategic plans and not just here's a project, here's a project. So it, to me, it feels really good to have that clarity that sort of Dan, that Dan sort of triggered on here. Uh, so far, uh, if I may summarize, we, ha we have a, a preamble that we need to write about some definitions, uh, f a couple of box A statements to upgrade the be bold and be curious to represent a few things. This in box B, um, the, the uh, sh shifting a bit of the first one to include now and in the future and then a reworking of the fourth. Uh, in box C, the uh, adaptive capacity to clarify that, uh, that, that this is about the, the community's capacity resilience. Um, is there anything in box D that, that, that strikes you as, as needing some attention or, or anything else that you see in this before we move on to the priorities? Uh, Jason first and then Laura. Jason Robinson, just had a quick question on box B before, or box, sorry, box C, item one, healthy, resilient watershed. Something I wanted to add that kind of ties back to the discussion that we were having just a little bit ago with regards to the tribes and first foods is, Bullet point two, or sorry, bullet point three, uh, healthy watersheds that sustain the health of people, their communities. Can we add and life ways? Where are you? Sorry, um, I, uh, box C, item one, oh. bullet point three. And you wanted and to add, add in we what? Add sorry? life ways. Life ways? Yes, because I think that's that ties us back to what we were having in conversation on this item four, that generational and really protecting those life ways, protecting culture. So I think adding that in there under healthy, resilient watersheds, that's, that's key um, from the tribe's perspective, so. Great. Laura. <laughs> Laura Masterson, this wasn't my original question, but do people know what that means? No. I think <laughs> we can use, <laughs> we can clarify that. Okay, yeah. okay, sounds cool. <laughs> All right, so um, my, my question is actually um, in D. Okay. And um, I think it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's above kind of wordsmithing. But the last, very last bullet point there uh, doesn't seem to fit with the others. Um, I think we're being very, I don't know what the grammatical word is, but we're, be, we're, we're not qualifying all our other statements, but for some reason in this one it says, doing what we can to do blah, 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 <laughs> instead of just saying like right. doing it. <laughs> <laughs> Feels like a cop out. There. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So make information available. Yes, please. <laughs> Debbie? All right, anything else? Yes, Rosemary? And just, um, let's see, for box D, uh, just having consistent terminology. So in earlier ones, we talked about monitoring and evaluation, and then we went to meaningful measurement on the one, two, three, fourth mm -hmm. uh, language. And that, that, I would say, demonstrating impact through meaningful monitoring and evaluation. So again, just having your consistent themes, uh, and then you've got 
measuring and communicating community impact, but I, I just think all of a sudden measurement came in there, and I, I just think it's good to have consistent terms. And what are you recommending the term be? Demonstrating impact through meaningful monitoring and evaluation instead of meaningful measurement. Yeah. It wasn't that, whereas you've been using monitoring and evaluation up right. until this point, and all of a sudden measurement just kind of fell flat for me. Yeah. I, Thank you for catching that. Suggestion? Now Debbie. Uh, so to Jason's, Debbie Holland, so to Jason's point about life ways, um, I like it. Um, I wonder if we're thinking about that beyond the tribal perspective and thinking about the working lands um, lifestyle of farmers, ranchers, uh, forestry, landowners, and sustaining that lifestyle. So as long as your thought process is inclusive of that and not more um, in the only the traditional tribal culture, uh, I'm good with it. So I just wanted to put that in. And then on, or under box D, um, we use two words, underserved and underrepresented. And I wonder if, we're, if we really mean, are they the same? Are they different? Do we mean one of them or not the, you know? Same, same kind of question as Rosemary of monitoring and measurement. That's a good uh, question. To me, they're two different things. And so I would just want to be intentional about which group we're talking about. Do, do you have a suggestion of, of, of how that how that should uh, look? What should be the, the, the headline and should we use the same for both or, or should we continue to use both words? Um, I, I'm okay with using both words as long as we're using them in context and it ties to that diversity section and the priorities. Yeah. Right? So I think there's a place for both underserved and underrepresented in the approach we take because um, yeah. I think it ties to the diversity and inclusion priority. Okay. But again, I'm just kind of try trying to seek clarity. Are, are we be actually being intentional or was it more just typing it in and right. great. And it, yeah, thank you for that. Okay, so this is obviously... Um, Bob? Yes, yes, Bob. Oh, I, I guess I had a question. Uh, when Jason uses the term life ways, I have no idea what that means. And unless you define it for me, it's a meaningless term. So we, we noted that too and, and mentioned to him that we will define it. We won't use that word. We will use the concept. The concept. Okay. Yeah. Until the world gets very familiar with the term, right, Jason? Um, Randy, will may we uh, check the sense of the board at this point and see if um, where 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 the board is related to? Uh, n this is not the the final version of of this, but we just uh, need your sense of is it looking pretty good at this point? We about about on the right track with with these adjustments that you've suggested. Um, can we can we uh, move toward the finalization of this? And, and Maida, do you have a Yeah, question? Maida Lofts Garden. Just um, the reason, <clears throat> just by way of background and for the record, um, the reason that we're using sense of the board in this is twofold. One, because we don't want to get into wordsmithing here. And if we do this, then you're going to have to vote to amend later. So we don't want to do that. But two, it's felt really important to us that the strategic plan is about the whole board, um, whereas other votes that we take are really about the voting members. A strategic plan is on behalf of the entire board, and so we're getting a sense of the board because some of the board members can't officially vote, but we want everybody's sense on this. So just for the record, that's our approach. Okay, uh, hang on, hang on. Uh, Ron. Dan. Ron and then. Uh, Ron Alvarado. I'm sorry. <clears throat> right. um, I'm sorry, I lost track of where we ended up with Deb's question on box D at the last. Did, yes. Did, would we say underserved and? underrepresented populations where, where do we end up with that um well where i thought we ended up was that we would go think about it okay, and, and okay. then propose something that made more sense and had or at least had some rationale and it was congruent with the rest of the documentation okay. thank you um, and, unless you'd like to make a pr proposal on it okay all right and then just dan and on that point 
Debbie. So Debbie. Dan, uh, Debbie oh, and sorry, Dan and Debbie. Dan. Well, if it's on that point, go ahead. I'd okay. Keep so I went back and read it again, kind of after my initial reaction of underserved, underrepresented, and the title underserved is not reflected in the bullets. It's all about underrepresented. That's my take. So if we want to add a bullet about underserved, I think that's going to solve the problem. Okay. Um, Rosemary. Um, just looking at that a little bit more on involving stakeholders and communicating. So we have stakeholders in the first, this is box D, the first line, bold line. And I think of stakeholders as key partners, people we work with, not necessarily the general public. So we have stakeholders and then underserved, underrepresented. Then the last bullet under the final one says doing what we can, communicating, to make information available to everyone. So in my mind, that becomes very much the general public. Yet it's under the involving the underserved, which I think that just, um, deserves more conversation. So you have just these different levels and maybe that one of them, or it could be involving stakeholders, public. You know, I mean, I think this information available to everyone is different from what I think the bold header is. Yes. And, I, and I think we're talking about stakeholders, public, and the underserved. So if we can just kind of clarify that and, and be clearer about what we mean, because we're either Thank tripping you. over ourselves or Right. I think we know what we want to say, but it just may not be coming out yet. Yeah, thank you for that. Mm -hmm. yeah. And maybe other things like that that you see, feel free to jot them down and we'll, we'll, we'll check. There may be a handful of other kinds of, of, uh, of, of areas in which we just haven't quite been clear enough on it. Uh, re related to the general concepts of this. Oh, sorry, did right, I miss? The one other, oh, this is Dan Thorndike on box D, just kind of following up your invitation. But the only thing, and I, I actually overall really like box D because it's so no. overall sort of succinct and thing. But we all the talk we've made about um, sort of our 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 loop decision on on being you know having some sort of flexibility, adaptive management, stuff like that. So in other words. Uh, whatever we will do will not have the impact we intend unless we we are flexible or however you want to say it. React when we see something that's not working, that we're willing to to acknowledge that and move on to something else, or to somehow incorporate that. That to me, that's a means. That's the best means. Is that we're you know we're not just going to say this is how we do it, and by gosh, we're going to not pay any attention to what the mm -hmm. results look like or what the, what the reaction is. Just yeah. some, whether it, it could be in one of these little bullets or in something, it just doesn't yeah. seem to be there at all. Whatever I, phrase that's, that's a good that point. Is. I have a, uh, this is Maida, I think I have a place to put that and that is um, a little bit of a shift because it really is about the adaptive management piece, the demonstrating impact through mean, meaningful monitoring and evaluation is also about adaptive management. That's where that flexibility and we, we have do cycles around how we learn and respond, and it's based on the way we monitor and evaluate that we don't just say, oh, that sucked, and we keep doing it the same way. Um, so I, I wonder that we couldn't maybe, Renee, working with you guys, build that concept into, okay. That's a great idea. Oh, uh, this is Randy. Um, in order to have the sense of the board, uh, I would, propose that anybody that still finds that they're troubled with some segment that we've covered this afternoon in this segment to speak up and you can go home and reflect on this further because it's not our last uh, shot to provide input but are we comfortable that we're on the right track and that we have reached a point where we have nothing left to do, <laughs> too, but um, cross the T's and dot the I's. And it will come, it will come back to you yeah. two to three more times. Yes. <clears throat> just okay. to clarify, With we're going to talk about the next yeah. part. Yes. I think what, yes. that's what we're just that's talking about box yeah. A through E. Steve's yeah. trying to get us desperately to the next part, I think. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Good. All right, I got the thumbs up from the chairs. So, um, so this next part, 
uh, th this was uh, this is a reflection of our conversation at uh, the Oregon Gardens, where um, we we uh, we thought through the, um, the 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 pivots that uh, that some of the reflection from your stakeholders, the survey, um, these listing sessions seem to suggest that there. Uh, and some of these were, were pivots of just a few degrees, some were, were larger pivots, and some were don't pivot at all kinds of things. And, and f from that conversation then, we began to, um, to think about what should be the priorities for the next five to 10 years. And we're, we're thinking of a horizon of a five to 10 year horizon, recognizing not all of this can be accomplished um, at once in this next year or two. And, um, and out of our conversation, um, eight ideas emerged from this. Um, typically, uh, typically we recommend that we don't have eight priorities, that we like narrow it down to four or five or six. But as, as, as we were talking with staff and, uh, and with your executive director, we realized just how significant each of these priorities is. And, um, and if there is, 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 there seems to be some energy and some ambition around building out um, these. So w well, how we would use these priorities would be for, uh, for, for you to turn this over to the staff and say, yes, this is a priority worth building out. And then the staff would, would sit down and think through, what are some strategies that we might develop or increase or, uh, or work out or build out more fully in order to be able to advance these areas? So um, what, what we need from you is a sense uh, of, are, are these the areas that we should build out? It might be that after we build them out, you take a look at them and you say, actually, now that we see this built out, we don't want to head that direction. So you're not committing yourself as a board to these directions, but you're giving permission to the, to, to the staff to, to invest some time and energy to, to build these out. So that's, that's one. Uh, uh, comment just to set the stage. Another comment to set the stage is that the, even though these are numbered, they, they're not put in any particular order of priority. So it says priorities and there are numbers to it. We just use the numbers so that you can identify them, but this doesn't mean that number one is actually the first priority. It means that all eight are in front of us. So let me, let me just read these again and then would love, love to uh, hear your discussion on this. Uh, so coordinated men monitoring and shared learning to advance watershed restoration effectiveness. Number two, uh, strategic partnerships to achieve healthy watersheds. So design, we'll design strategies to, to build strategic partnerships. Number three, increase citizen awareness of relationship between people and watersheds. This has to do with a broader idea uh, of the, the boxy um, citizen care. Number four, bold and innovative actions to achieve health in Oregon's watershed. So this would be the staff designing strategies to promote, to catalyze bold innovations. Number five, the value of working lands is fully integrated into watershed health. So we design strategies to move that forward. Number six, community capacity is enhanced to support resilient watersheds. This uh, correlates uh, exactly with one of our intended impacts on the big picture. Number seven, watershed or organizations have access to diverse and stable funding portfolios. And uh, number eight, leaders at all levels of watershed work reflect the diversity of Oregon. This is uh, an equity and diversity. Okay, may we hear your thoughts on this? Yes. Uh, well, um, so one is just a, a, is a language one across all of those bullet points. So number three, for instance, says increase citizen awareness. So there's a directive, a direction there to increase the awareness. And others are just statements. And it's not clear to me what, whether they sh are supposed, I wasn't in that, that whole session, so I don't have the context there. But strategic partnerships to achieve healthy water. It is stronger partnerships or new partnerships or, you know, there's a missing. Yes. Uh, Action action yeah. associated yeah. to that or or there's an extra one in the other either they're supposed to be all neutral and then it's described underneath or the title is supposed to tell you where it's going with stuff underneath thank you for that catch it's intended to be the latter of your of your options that that these are are are, are descriptions of of, of, Which of areas of impact 
and then as the staff builds into them, they, they, would, they would then wrestle with, is it increased or strengthened or broadened or deepened or, or, newer. or newer, yeah. Okay, yeah, so you, you guys are telling us buckets. Yes, buckets to work on. We will then say we achieve that with new or strengthened or, um, yeah. yeah. So then the nomenclature on number three, we would remove the increase for this version. So that was, that was misplaced. Thanks for catching that. Uh, this is Randy. Uh, just as a um, aside, when you, like for instance, number three, you flesh this out with strategies, new, new or enhanced or whatever. Uh, are we? Do we anticipate that we'll establish timelines or? As well? Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. D d timelines, sequences, um, measures of output, and then we'll we'll think also through uh, indicators of, of achievement, so outcome. We'll both do some, some output and outcome measures on these. Alan. Alan Henning. Um, and number two, strategic partnerships to achieve healthy watersheds. Kind of keying off um, Will's comment, are we referring to, are we, we insinuating, will you be looking at both large and small partnerships and, and strategic partnerships for both large and small partnerships, okay. Yes. Uh, Dan. Yeah, on regarding number five, the value of working lands is fully integrated into watershed health. And it, it does seem to be broader than the concept of just working lands. There's one of the bullet points that talks about um, extending to you know rural and other landowners. I guess the point is lands where people are living or whatever. And I think Jason may be like, channeling my comment here, um, there doesn't seem to be any kind of tribal, to me that would be an appropriate place to include some kind of a reference to the tribal things where the lands are held, they are occupied, they're being used or things, but it perhaps not in the, in the same sense as those other points are. So just a bullet point or something. Okay. Well, thank you, that's really helpful. Ron. Uh, number six. Are we, in terms of community capacity, are we, are we talking about just building that capacity to participate or also, or in addition to help with conservation implementation? Both. Okay. So as you can see, these are, these are buckets um, that are fairly large and, and, and you would be telling the staff like figure this out, um, design some strategies to, to move this move this forward. Laura. Laura Masterson, I just wanted to support the, um, the suggestion that Kelly raised, which is um, adding acquisition uh, or making it clear that restoration do, is, uh, is, is a big bucket that also includes acquisition. Um, number four, the bullets are two and four. So at the bottom, OAS have increased nimbleness and adapt, uh, adaptability as grantees propose and do adaptive restoration and acquisition work. So it seems like there's a couple ways to get at that, but I just wanna make sure it's clear in there. This is Maida, I would just recommend based on the fact the importance of this to the um, land trust community, I would recommend the former that we add that, those words. So just, this is Debbie. Uh, Debbie. Just, just to counter that, I would say we could also just strike restoration in those two bullets. No, I'm, I'm sorry, say that one more time. We could then. strike restoration instead of adding acquisition so that we're doing a potential gain of proposed innovative work, whatever that work is, whether it's restoration, whether it's acquisition, whether it's education and outreach, it's proposed, you know, innovative. <laughs> so just a different take on it is you could, and we talk about restoration in so many other places, I don't think it would necessarily hurt us to strike it there, but I'm, I'm also comfortable adding acquisition. Okay. 
Yeah. Okay, we can play yes. around with okay. it. You could play around with it. Got it. There's, like, like Laura said, there's a couple different ways you could get at it. Define it, add it, strike it. Got it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Jason. Jason Robinson, just a quick question for Meta. With regards to bullet point four, I know we had a lot of conversation about risk and making sure that as a board we're fiscally accountable as well. And, and I see some of that kind of developed in here, but I wonder if as the staff take this on, if they can set some sideboards for what that might look like for us to take into account as we're looking at yes. that as a priority. And I think that'll be a clearer to our partners so they can see what does that risk mean? Are they, you know, what can we take on? What should we take on those sorts of things? Yes, that, that would be, I think we need to, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, uh, well, the, uh, also on the risk stuff, since I wasn't uh, there for the conversation, having an established process for gauging the risk and weighing it against the potential gain, I'm just wondering how, whether that's really possible to have a, and what discussion there was about having an established process for gauging risk when it seems like it's different for everything. You know, we part of the reason we redid the uh, council grants was because we felt that there was now more risk in, we weren't doing a good a job of evaluating the strength of those uh, councils and so we wanted to uh, make some changes. Um, but that's kind of different than the whole set of risks associated with starting the FIP program. And so I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm unsure about how you, we would have an established process for gauging risk. Yeah. Uh, or if you've got, um, process that's, I don't know what it, what it, what it, what it would be. Yeah, but, so I'm interested in what you yeah. guys talked about there. So this is Maida. I, I think what we talked about is exactly what you just talked about. And I wonder if we actually say instead of OWEB has an established process for gauging risk, um, OWEB has established approaches for gauging risk. Because what we talked about in that session, for example, if you take the small grant program, very low risk, also very low reward, right? We have a set of practices. We don't spend a lot of time on them. We know those practices work. We spend $15,000, we know what we're gonna get. It's not, it's, and it, and it isn't a $5 million dam removal, which is super high risk, but super high reward. And so I, th I think what we talked about in that meeting is exactly what you said is, it, there isn't actually one process but if we can establish approaches, so when we talk about capacity, here are some basic things that have to be in place. But but then beyond that, we can take a lot of risk. And once those once people are at that base level, we can, which is a very different set of risk than the FIP program, a different set of risk than the acquisitions program. And I think the push, for example, on the acquisitions program is, we went from accepting all the risk to accepting no risk, and we got to find a middle ground, but I think in each of those it might be different, so this probably isn't the right terminology. There are um, eight uh, categories here, and um, if I, and maybe correct me if, if I misheard you, but there seems to be some, some interest in building out all, all these eight, if you want to so authorize. Um, I guess related to that question is, is, is there one on here that, that you want to tell the staff, no, don't, don't bother with that one. Uh, just focus on these six or seven. And may I just may want to check with you to make sure that that's, that's I heard you correctly. Okay. Steve? Steve, I'm sorry. over here. Steve. Yeah, just a uh, maybe clarification. In number six, if you look at community capacity, I, I understand the bullet, but when I start reading the words, it seems like they've all been said before because the first sentence is about, <coughs> um, well, it talks about partnerships at all levels, broad citizen engagement, using science, and so forth, and even the bullets talk about more about partnerships. So I'm wondering if that can be... Uh, somehow more identified as a as an independent kind of bullet um, so i know i know they're all connected but uh -huh. i don't see the distinguishing marks in that one so what i hear you say is leave six but be clear about why six is distinct from everything else 
g yeah. give it its own. Yeah, I understand the bullet and what was trying to be made by the bullet, but but I don't. The text itself looks like it said before in yeah. under partnership and elsewhere. You know. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And there's a little bit of that in number seven too, um, which I think means is a bullet to highlight funding, stable funding. Uh -huh. But some of the Im immediate text under that again talks about the need for partnerships, and and um, we already have a separate bullet for that. And Good. Just trying to thank you. That's, make them that's separate really helpful. Yeah. So they're discrete. Right. Yeah, and independent ideas. Yeah. <clears throat> Debbie. I'm sorry, Debbie. So just on uh, Steve's point, I, I was just at the same place with number seven and number two. Like it seemed like there's a, there's a lot of overlap in seven and two. The difference is the funding, right? So if mm -hmm. seven is really just about funding, then make it just yeah. about that. Okay. Good. Or if we want to have less than eight, <laughs> um, <laughs> right. lump it with number two. <laughs> make that a subset of number two. <laughs> as a diehard lumper. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, Rosemary. No, another quick point. Um, number one, in my mind, is a very important one, and I think we heard that in the variety of forums. Yes. And there are lots of different parts of it with regard to the monitoring evaluation. We've talked about adaptive management. What I'm not seeing, and I'm going to suggest as a bullet, is some way to communicate those results and right. which I think would be an old web role and the only reason I got confused about that and wanted to add communicate those results of the of monitoring is under three it says o web will catalyze the influence of partners to carry messages which makes me think o web's not going to do it but is going to catalyze others I wasn't quite sure what that meant. It sounds a little <laughs> convoluted, but I think there is a role for OWEB to communicate, particularly in this number one with regard to the monitoring evaluation, because individual groups can't do it. Where, at what level, is there a statewide look or a large landscape look which might cover multiple watersheds or multiple partners? So I think there's a, a comprehensive OWEB role, I would uh, like to suggest. And then, yes, our partners carry messages, um, catalyze the influence of partners. Maybe there's a better way we can say that. But um, so I think there's no web. I'm going to repeat myself. If, if I may speak to both, because this point three is really important, and it relates back to something that Sean said earlier. So I do want to tell you what you're saying in number three. To make sure that you're clear about that. Um, so in in number in number one, absolutely, I think we can add the communicating. I think we are the appropriate entity, and we will absolutely do that. In number three, the challenge that we have, and and um, Sean raised it when she spoke and said, "Okay, we don't. We're going to be very interested to find out how you're going to do number three when you don't have funding for it anymore, right?" for the broad citizen outreach piece. And what we are saying here is we don't have funding anymore. We have to catalyze our partners to do some of the work that we used to fund, that we can't now create a new grant offering that we just found out that legally we can't have. And so really number three is have helping give partners the information and, and what they need. So, so for example, we can complete a study under number one that talks about the huge economic impact, the 33,000 jobs, the 15 to 24 jobs for every million dollars invested. We can gather all of that information. We, we, OWEB, cannot do a huge outreach campaign, but we can certainly infuse that information into the 19 land trusts who reach out to 70,000 people to carry that forward. So, so the key in number three is that OWEB probably is not the entity who's gonna be doing this big statewide campaign. So we can work with Lottery to do some pretty cool stuff because they have a lot of money. Um, but a lot of what we will be doing is developing the things that then people can use in their community because the other, the most, the other thing is that we have found the most effective people to reach out in community are the people who live in the community. Um, so that, so number three, 
really is about how do we catalyze the influence of our partners in their community and give them all of the tools and the information they need, knowing that OWIB is not going to be the entity. We don't have the authority or the funding to be the entity to do that work. So it is, it is a unique set of wording that is in here, and I want to make sure you guys understand that. Well, it is interesting because, what, and so it depends on the bubble that are above our, above our heads. Um, so best means, and I don't want to go, we're not going to go backwards, but I kept seeing that there was a role for OWEB, collaborating and authentically communicating, make available, make information available yes. to everyone, measuring and communicating. Um, so I thought OWEB would be doing some of that as far as means yes. versus... But not, but not, if you look at number three, that increasing citizen awareness of the relationship between people in our watersheds, we will be doing that largely in partnership. So we are absolutely developing the information, we are developing the um, ap approaches, some best ideas, but we are, are often not the most effective entity to communicate it to the people. We communicate it well to our partners who can carry that into community. And so it's just, it's it, the reason three if, if OWEB was increasing citizen awareness without partners, we would be doing big, big PR communications campaigns. And we don't have the money or the authority to do that, mm -hmm. but with our partners, we can give the information and the tools and the resources that make them effective in their communications. Well, I just think we have to be careful when we talk about reaching and involving underserved populations, underrepresented, that to me does speak to quite potentially how would you do that in hmm. large potential campaigns and we can can i get so i i guess it's it is it gets to the how yeah gets to the but how. i think we have yes. to be careful not to set up false expectations yeah. or people's yeah the yeah, bubble above your how. head says oh web's going to do that and yep. yeah it gets to the how so one of the things that we did this last year that could be an example is partnered with ocean and provided some diversity training at the connect conference so we were, not, we were not going out and doing outreach to underserved populations, but we brought in the experts to talk with the councils and the districts about how to do that. Um, so you're right, we can't describe that here, but our strategies will lay that, those things out um, so that we're clear about what we achieve with, we can't do it with 35 employees, but you catalyze the phenomenal partnership you just saw up in front of us we can do really amazing things in this state when we catalyze that very differently than 35 employees can do. I, I guess, uh, uh, Stephen. Uh, Steve Brand, I guess that raises some questions for me then, because I'm wondering if there is any sort of a stakeholder engagement role then with OWEB, and it seems, it seems like there is, and it seems like dialogue and communication and all that is very much part of it. And this bullet here, the way I heard you describe it was, well, that is primarily for the citizens who are not part of any of these other processes. Oh, no, 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 I didn't mean that. So then I, 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 no. I think that this could be reworded in a way that, um, to include those other mechanisms, that certainly OWEB does uh, carry on dialogues and stakeholder engagement and more, more the in-depth, mm -hmm. and, it, and it's not necessarily the staff of OWEB, but it's through various funding of restoration programs and stakeholder engagements, the way they do all of, all of their work. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then you could use that specific sentence you said that they will kind of foster others to do things for the broader public or citizens or things like that that could, uh, so you could make that whole thing far more encompassing to include this, the citizens who are not necessarily involved in the stakeholder engagement process, but um, to what I'm saying, because if you just... I, I hear what you're saying, but I'm not sure what change. Can you help us? What, what do you want to see here? I, I think you could keep the bullet the way it is, because citizens include everyone, mm -hmm. and includes, in my view, stakeholders are also, uh, citizens are also stakeholders. Uh, but then add a sentence or two that talk about uh, stakeholder engagement or communication or dialogue process or in-depth partnerships and awareness, which is what is said in other parts of this document. Good. That that is something that OWIB does. And then, and then, and then, then it would also catalyze the influence. I mean, that's also part of it as Good. well. Okay, perfect. Yeah. 
know, it's helpful. Um, Will and then Alan. So I'm uh, struggling with number six a bit, which is community capacities enhanced. I guess you're gonna take out the enhanced uh, to support resilience in watersheds. So when I read this, most of this seems to actually be part of number two, strategic partnerships. Uh. Um, I, I get the sense that it's supposed to be the focus on the community side, but almost all that stuff would fit under yeah. the improved partnerships in number two. So I'm yeah. not quite sure whether we haven't hit the right bullet items and so forth for what we're trying to convey we there. I think yeah. we haven't hit the right bullet items. That's, uh, that relates to Steve's comment about that as well. We, we, we can uh, make that more yeah. discreet and more, more independent and more about the community capacity instead of the partnerships. Yeah. Um, Is, if I, what we're trying to do in number six, just to make sure you all are comfortable with it, what we heard you say in June and our external folks is, this is really about local organizational capacity, but it is not solely anymore just about councils and districts. It now is about land trusts. It is about estuary partnerships. It is about um, other local um, groups, um, friends of groups and others. So this is about what capacity looks like in the future that is councils, districts, land trusts, and and so I think that's where we're not clear that we started to spread into. So what we're trying to say here, what we heard you all talking about in June is we got to support a local network of capacity. So we don't just say councils, districts, land trusts, but this is about the capacity of those groups, not about, how, not about the partnerships, which is what's on the first page. And I think we just missed it in terms of our language that number six is really about how do we support capacity in communities. Does that, if fo if we get clear on that, is that a concept that folks are comfortable with? Yes. So it's like the Lomakotsis, yep. Ron, of the world that are were never on our radar screen before but are critical to the work that we the work? do. Lomakotsi, they're a nonprofit restoration partner. They're not a traditional, they, we don't think of them typically, but we need to. Um, is, it, is it partnership capacity then? Which it, this, what you guys said was this is, was about community, and so we want to be clear that this is this one is about what's happening locally, different than. Yeah. The, the, so if I understand, you're saying that in six partnership refers to these organizations, whereas in number two, partnerships refer, refers to three or five, yeah. three or f six people getting together to do something. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. That as a result of this partnership effort that terminology in six sends us off in a direction that we don't mean to be sent off in. So we can, if you're comfortable with the concept of we want good, strong capacity in communities, that's how we can rebrand number, reframe number six. Yeah. Okay. I'll, uh, Is that, we get in a better spot, Will? For yeah, that's good. Alan Henning, uh, on number eight, are we referring to where it says leaders of all levels at all levels of watershed work reflect the diversity of Oregon's population or Oregon's habitats? Population. And then we should say that. Where do we say, where is it? We say it in the very title and then we also say it in the middle. Well. When I read this, I could see the diversity in the Oregon habitats. You go to the east, southeast, to the northwest and you're looking at coho right. and rainforest yeah. and forests Southeast, sage, grouse, and all that. That's good. This is about the people. Yeah. Yeah. yeah the intent was about the people. Yep. It is. It is people. Well, no, this one is very specifically people. Or we talk people. a lot about habitat. So this is the place where we talked about at the meeting. The governor, want her one of her top three priorities in the state is a people diversity. And we should say that. Yep. Population. Yeah. It's 43% of the population will be Hispanic in 2020 or 2025, and we need to have leaders reflecting that. And rural, urban, but Catching not that. habitat types. That's a great change of title. Um, yeah. Dan, and then yeah. Randy. I hate to go back, and maybe this was all, because I got a bit confused on the whole discussion about number three, the increased citizen awareness part. But when I keep reading that and looking at that again, and if this is supposed to be a priority pivot point, I just don't, the only word, the only action the OWEB will catalyze, and the rest is stuff we've never been able to do 
in my history, it, we're for all the reasons that I think that Mita talked about, is that we're just not set up to do any of that kind of work. I'm just wondering why three is there at all, I guess, if we're trying, as it just doesn't seem to rise to the level of any of the other ones, not only, and not, not necessarily in terms of its importance or lack of importance, just in terms of our ability to, to do that at all because we've tried, everything we've ever tried at the statewide level, that thing has just never worked. So this is Meta. Um, there, there are a couple reasons this is here. One is it was probably the biggest thing that we heard in listening sessions, sessions. in the external advisory group. In it, we got to lean into this one, and and I have come to believe that actually there are ways that we can do this. Um, I think that that um, I'll give the example of the. Um, why did it just go out of my head, Kelly? The um, State of the Lands report. Um, we are now in a place where actually our partners with us are developing the storytelling. So there are stories that we can get out of our um, project completion reports. We now have a person on board who is just digging into those and helping draw out stories. Um, we have partners who have a, a savvy that, to be honest, our partnership did not have five, six years ago. Um, for all Across all four of our partners, we're sitting in a different place. Um, we have a partnership with Lottery that I think is gonna um, just jump. Um, we have our 20th anniversary coming up in the next year and a half and they are just thrilled and they've got some money to invest. So I actually think we are now Good. in a spot. But on that, I mean, to me, that's a lean then. I mean, yeah. I'm just, just going from yep. previous, and especially you talk about Lottery, I and mean, it's like, Yep. We didn't even exist. Yeah, I've been in the same spot as you over time, and you and I have had this conversation yeah. a lot, and I actually firmly feel like we are finally in a spot where, again, we won't be doing the outreach, but we can put things out through electronic media that we weren't able to do before. I was floored, and we have, I think, copies for you. When we asked for a call to the legislator, uh, to Congress about um, Pacific Coastal Salmon Recovery Fund, our partners responded in a way I've never seen them be able to do in the past. And so I think we finally matured where we really can. And now be a reagent. Yeah. If you're looking at the real, right, for catalysts. Yes. Good. Okay. Good. Yeah. I like it. So uh, and uh, this is Randy. Uh, nice. Meta, uh, on that issue, and I, I'm encouraged to hear you respond that way. Are, just for my uh, information, are we able to accept pro bono help in this area or, and or can we benefit from grants from some of our partners to do this? Um, this, is, this is Maida. I would respond by saying that the other piece of I, what I believe is incredibly important is that I would encourage those kind of funds to go to our partners, not directly to OWEB. So I think if there is an opportunity for pro bono work and or grants that using OCEAN and the Coalition of Oregon Land Trust and OACD in the network as that avenue, I think is, I, I think what I see is I want us to build that capacity in and amongst all of our partners. So again, we can use lottery and that's what we can bring to the table. Um, but I would say that as a partnership of all of us, including OWEB at the table with these folks, I absolutely do think we can do that. We may not be the receiver. And just a reminder that at, at this point, you, you would be um, uh, authorizing the staff to try to figure it out. Uh, so you'd still have a chance to take a look at the strategies, but you'd be saying, no, this, the, to, to, yeah, build, yes, yes. build some ideas around this, then come back to us with with each of these things quick comment jason robinson so as i read through these and we talk about three i've even you know looking at seven looking at two when we start talking about strategic partnerships what oweb can influence is the ability for those partnerships to grow and start moving these things forward so i wonder if there's a way to tie those three together as opposed to having eight but bring them together because when you have good partnerships you have a better funding portfolio because those those partners then can outreach to other partnerships so that creates that diverse funding portfolio as part of our process through the FIP we have developed more partnerships that are now educating and providing that so that we're getting at that to some degree so I wonder how do you come can we combine those 
or are, or do we really have to have those broken down? Because when you start having robust partnerships, I think we're going to get to some of these things. Mm -hmm. So just a question, I guess. Respond. Uh, uh, can you just what were the three that you were talking about combining again? So um, you know, item two talks about strategic three, partnerships yeah. to achieve healthy watersheds, and I think there's a lot of things within that that we can add. Um, part of that is through through healthy through strategic partnerships, we create awareness and we um, have that ability for people to build relationships and, and uh, educate communities. And then we also have the ability to diverse, you know, diversify funding portfolios by having so these. Two, three, and seven. Two, three, and seven, yeah. yeah. So I, I might speak in response to that. And I am speaking as a lifelong lumper. So this <laughs> is a hard thing for me to say because I really no, like no. that idea. But. The one thing I will say is the number and types of strategies we develop actually will be the same. So you're not decreasing staff's work, honestly, if, if you combine those all together. If those three things are important to you, I don't know that lumping them, lumping them doesn't reduce our workload any. And I would just say, particularly on three, it, it could be, I mean, two is kind of an overarching statement. Two is how we do life, right? We do it in partnership. Um, but three and seven, there are people who really are, these words are really important to them, some of our stakeholders. And so the caution I would give, being a lifelong lumper, is that when I want to talk to funders and I say one of our board's priorities is that watershed organizations have a diverse and stable funding portfolio, that actually means something to people like Meyer and um, Ford Family Foundation and others that I think could get lost. So if, it, if it's not really reducing our work any, and I think number three is kind of really important to the Watershed Council world, um, I would tend to say it doesn't, it doesn't actually save us such much and it might gain us some by having, being more clear about the words that are there. Yeah, so that, so that speaks to the comment that was made earlier about let's be really crisp yeah. yes. about what these seven, eight things actually are and what is the distinct difference between them that we're aiming at Yes. Yeah. That's, I, I think, think that's, that's our bigger issue. Yeah. So this is sort of like being curious. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. <laughs> I'm curious. <laughs> <laughs> Any other input here? So we have a consensus for you, I think. Wonderful. Okay, so this, this then is, well, your authorization for us to go get to work. We'll roll up our sleeves. <laughs> we'll start to build some ideas out, and we'll come back to you with with strategies and and um, and and, uh, and approaches for your for your consideration. And I assume, Steve, we might say back to the board. Boy, we played around with this, and we actually found out that these two are just yes. Enough. So we we may come back to you. We have. I think what we heard from you is that kind of lack of clarity that we have around those three means we got to either get clear or we may say to you actually the strategies are kind of the same and so yeah okay, okay so uh, next steps just so you know where we're headed and then I'll um, yield this time we'll, we will uh, gather staff together and begin working on this um, uh, D designing strategies for each of the priority. Uh, and along the way, we will also include others in, in focus groups or working groups or, or convening groups or advisor groups or whatever to be able to get expertise, glean expertise from around the state from a variety of different uh, stakeholders and groups, including probably some who are here today, partners to help us think about, about the, the actual approach that could be taken or the a series of approaches that could be taken for each strategy. So we'll be utilizing focus groups of stakeholders. Um, since this is, uh, this is work that will span a few months, we, we will keep the executive committee apprised of the progress uh, on a regular basis. I think, uh, I forget how frequently, mo monthly, every other month? Sure. It's regularly. <laughs> 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 Something like that. We. Um, and then also uh, along the way, we will uh, in, involve the advisory, the external advisory group as well, given their, um, their, their sense of ownership of this progress, of this process, as well as their, their uh, uh, wonderful insight from where they sit in the community. Uh, so once, once we begin to have some shape to the strategies, we'll invite them to give some reflection on that. 
and then uh, and then we'll bring these back to you as a draft for you to be able to to um, to, to reflect on before before we begin to lock it in. Okay. Anything more, Matt? Oh, uh, what's the what's the t the time for all this is happening before our next board meeting? Is that? Uh, um, let me look. It'll be happening all it, all through the fall. Yeah, all through yeah. the fall and winter. The and winter. Um, the goal is to have, um, our early goal was to have a strategic plan by April of next year. Our late goal was October of next year. I think we're shooting right now that we would be towards the early end. Um, but we held the, those dates just in case you do something like you did today and give us really good feedback that we need to take back and digest for a little while, <laughs> um, which was wonderful. Um, so, so the we do have an external advisory group meeting scheduled before the next board meeting. We have some executive committee meetings scheduled. The focus groups could be some before and some after the next meeting. So look at this to kind of flow through fall and winter, but uh, I'll, there will be a fair amount of work done before the next board meeting, but there will be a lot more work done before the January board meeting as yes. well. Okay. Uh, yes, Bob. Uh, Bob Weber. <coughs> When um, they come back with the information, whether it be from staff, focus groups, executive committee, external advisory committee, it's kind of nice to know where it's coming from so that you can kind of get a feel for what the source of it is. We'll, we'll, we'll try to do that. <laughs> that, that sounds good. Um, any other suggestions? Okay, thanks very much, Steve. Thank you, Steve. And, uh, Erica, do you want to talk logistics? Logistics. Sure. Um, so first we'll talk about meals. Tonight's dinner will be in the adjacent room, the Wellsprings room. Uh, we're, I'm waiting for it to be delivered. <laughs> I'll take it in the parking lot. Um, so the remainder of our time together, meals will be in the ho hotel, they have a restaurant, and there's a little room upstairs. So we'll have breakfast, lunch, and dinner there tomorrow, and then on Wednesday, and they'll provide lunch over here, a kind of a to-go style lunch on Wednesday before we go home. Um, I think there was anything else we wanted to I guess that's it. I'll let you know. <laughs> okay, we're, thanks, we're adjourned. <laughs>